Guess who just popped into the studio? I'm really, really thrilled to be able to say my dear friend, who you all know from podcast number one, I believe it was, of course. My dear friend Michael Dunn is in town and we said, why don't you come over and, and let us know what's going on in your life and uh, chat with us about the news that I had just given in the last podcast, about podcast 13, because he has some uh, interesting insights into the Hawk of the Covenant, the Templars. So, would you please welcome Michael Dunn. Alan, my dear. <laughs> Thank you for having me. This is great. I am I am honored and thrilled. Oh. No, for real. Yeah. Pleasure's ours. I'm glad you're in town. What, what were you doing in town, by the way? Well, I'm working on a documentary project no? uh, on the spiritual life of Elvis Presley and some heretofore unheard um conversations and also seeing old friends and um you know i live in colorado in the high mountain valley and but i've spent 25 years in la and it's just great to be back and especially as you know this particular block in the city of los angeles was my home for a long time so mm. and to be in in uh bard world in alan green world <laughs> It's always unique. Can't let that go by, though. You said the spiritual life of Elvis Presley. Uh, yes. That not many people know about that, I imagine. Uh, well, no, they don't. Uh, this is uh, the project is called Echoes of the King. Mm -hmm. And uh, it began with uh, a series of conversations starting in 1963 when Elvis befriended uh, a young Southern California housewife happily married mother who became his friend and over the period pretty much the rest of his life up until 1977 she became one of his confidants not his only one but you know, because his life was under such pressure and he was in this prison of fame and also Colonel Parker and the Memphis Mafia you know controlled access to him and the kind of life he could live and he had this intense yearning for god and he had this actual his original desire was to be a gospel singer and he was a deep metaphysical seeker and student and and became um a follower of the teachings of paramahansa yogananda not many people knew that for a long time and um, his close friend larry geller who was his hairstylist um you know wrote a a beautiful couple of books about that but but these are actual recordings of Elvis having intimate really revealing conversations with a trusted friend and you see how deep a soul he was and his phenomenal magnetism and actual reports of his paranormal abilities psychokinesis the ability like he could move a an ashtray heavy ashtray across the table from a distance of five feet and turn the lights out and his hands shot off blue sparks and he didn't do this a lot just you know for trusted friends but i mean those are just parlor tricks but he had such an amazing impact as a soul on our world um the merging of black and white culture the civil rights movement at that time obviously the birth of rock and roll the beatles would never have happened without all this john lennon said that several times and so he was just perhaps one of the most influential souls of the 20th century and this is a whole side of him that has not been revealed before that comes out in these recordings and so i'm producing and writing it and we are making progress so more will be revealed oh, sounds fascinating yeah. that's not well as you said it's not <laughs> it's not that it's not well known it's not known at all because of course he has this public persona of elvis the king of rock and roll yeah but it sounds like he had a yearning that he couldn't fulfill because of the role he was playing, which would be rather tragic, I would think. Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, and he says in, in one of the recordings that, you know, he says, my spiritual self, my inner being, I have this need to connect with other people's spiritual selves and inner beings. He says, and I can't get in that position. My career won't allow it. 
my management won't allow it, my friends won't allow it, and he said, and I have this need for more, it's driving me crazy. He says it again, it's driving me crazy. I'll end up a blundering fool if I don't solve this somehow. And you've got Elvis on tape saying this? Yes, yes, we do. Wow. Yeah. In confidence to who? Who was he talking to, to um, all the time? Wanda, who um, was his confidant, and who refused a lot of money for a lot of years for the for the recordings. She wrote her own book, uh, We Remember Elvis. Um, she turned down a big offer from Macmillan, um, but they wanted to spice it up. And in her view, Elvis's name had already been smeared by mm. some of the quote tell-all books written by mm. his form by by friends whom he trusted. Mm. And as Elvis said about those books, well, there was, some of it was true, but a lot of it was just made up. Of course. And so, um, so Wanda kept to this. You know, she turned down money for many years, and because of her trust in um, Reverend Maya, who's uh, our friend in Colorado, she gave her permission um, to write her book. Um, Maya has a wonderful book on the whole spiritual context of Elvis's life called Blue Star Love. You can get it on Amazon. And uh, when I moved to Colorado and befriended Maya, um, we realized the time was right to make a documentary. So we're making wow. good progress. That's yeah. great to hear. Any estimated time when you think it will be out? We're aiming for summer of 22. Uh -huh. And you said that he was very interested in the teachings of Aramansa Yogananda. Well, mm, yes, is that was. documented as well? Oh, yeah, that's documented. I mean, Priscilla Presley talks about it in her book. Larry Geller talks about it. That's not mm. unknown. Um, but a lot of what comes out in these conversations is things that have not been revealed. Mm. So... Um, I had heard. Stay tuned, folks. I had heard only within the SRF, that's Self Realization Fellowship Circles, that we all know, we've heard that, oh, Elvis showed up at the Mother Center wanting to see uh, Diamata, who was the right. president uh, after Yoga Time had passed. So he showed up, and were they friends? Uh, they were, yes, they were indeed. Um, and Elvis had lost his mother, you know, his mother died young, and broke his heart they were very close he was only I think 22 or so 23 maybe uh, when she passed and so Diamata was very much a spiritual mother figure to him and he was on fire for God he wanted to become a monk he wanted to give up he was tired of like the, at that point he was just making the mediocre movies he was no longer appearing in concert and so Daima told him, you know, no, Elvis, dear, you are, God made you Elvis Presley for a reason, to sh spread your light, share your light that way, and not as Brother Elvis, mm. you know, or a minister. So uh, okay. so he was in, you know, he studied the lessons and was in touch with her for many years. How uh, touching. So, Michael, you've seen now the connection between Bargast 13 and Bargast 14 um, and you're aware of the the, the the extraordinary implications of of how f for me I should just say that it it, it, it was a, a very tricky thing to go through to be receiving these codes uh, about the King James Bible, about various aspects of the idea of the Ark of the Covenant, not really sure where it was going, but giving us a very definite look at something that we're, you know, the world is kind of aware of, Ethiopia. Graham Hancock had written a book, The Sign and the Seal. Uh, I think it's as long ago as 35 or 40 years ago. I'm not sure on that, but he had followed that that whole journey of the idea that the ark might be in Ethiopia, it might have been taken out of Solomon's temple during the reign of the evil King Manasseh, sometime around about 660 BC, maybe spirited away on a boat down the Nile, ends up on Elephantine Island for a couple of hundred years. And we do know that 
the Jewish community settled there and built a temple that was literally a modeled on the Solomon's Temple in its dimensions. Of course, we have no record of it now, but that's what writings say. And they were there for a couple of hundred years. And then it's not as though they just were, there was a war or they were massacred or anything. They just suddenly, were, they weren't there. They didn't hang around. They, they, they weren't buried there or anything. They just got out of town. And so there's a hypothesis that they have the Ark with them. And that then they carried on down into Lake Tana area of Ethiopia. So that's a known thing. You can search that online and find all kinds of documentaries and stories about that possibility that the Ark is in Ethiopia and specifically in this church in Aksum. And I'm finding all of this on these codes embedded in the King James Bible. But I felt I'd reached a point where oh, I got it all. It all fell into place beautifully. And that very night, I remember sitting back and thinking, wow, we can talk about this. This is a, we need to start a conversation, engage the world on this. And I literally just did a search on uh, Wikipedia. Well, what does Wikipedia say about the Ark of the Covenant? Because I don't go there as my first place. You know, it's a bit dodgy sometimes. And there was a little line, just one line, saying something about there seems to be a bit of a problem in Ethiopia. Click here. And I clicked and found out all this news about this. This massacre had just happened at the time that I was literally going on, the, on this, this journey. So really shocking. And now you've seen the other part of it. So we've seen that there are codes in the Old Testament engraving. There are codes in the New Testament engraving. And there are even codes where the two slot together and are meant to be a, a sort of a super grid. So I particularly wanted you on the program to give us your insight into, I mean, I know you have other viewpoints that may, may be tangential to this and some may, may mm -hmm. correlate. So you want to just talk a little bit about your own history with the idea of the Ark and the Templars and where you think that fits into what you've seen in in the King James Bible codes? Yeah, well, I became very involved in a movement to restore the original order of the Knights Templar, to linearly restore the original medieval order. And I only got involved in that because of my interest in helping to create a new international court of human rights that could address the sort of systematic crimes of the corrupt elite whereby they maintain control and do things like military industrial complex fomented wars and things like that but i'd also i'd always had from childhood you know an identification with um with chivalry king arthur knights of the round table camelot and all that and so um for a five-year period, I was intimately involved with a movement to restore the original order, if that could linearly be done. Now, you bring out um, in this work a link you know, to the Templars, to specific dates that are revealed in the codes, of years that were crucial, particularly in the downfall uh, of the Templars. Yeah. On October 13, 1307, King Philip IV of France staged his infamous raid. It's actually part of why Friday the 13th is a date of ill omen ever since then. And the Templars were arrested throughout Europe, um, interrogated and under torture, made to sign false confessions. 54 of them were burned at the stake in 1312. And then, of course, uh, the last Grand Master, Jacques de Molay, was uh, recanted his confession and was burned at the stake um, in 1314. And <clears throat> so that acquainted me with several things directly related to what you were sharing, um, specifically about the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the Holy Grail, the research that um, the man who was spearheading this movement, Matthew, had done 
on the origin of the Ark of the Covenant, on the likelihood that there was more than one, on the links to Pharaonic Egypt, is particularly fascinating material. And then when I um, left that movement in um, August of 2018, and some of the Templar members who left with me started a different organization in Colorado, we began to, or I began to learn about a another arc of that story, if you will, of the prehistory of the arc before it shows up in biblical history or legend. And, you know, this falls into the realm of what some might call channeled material. I prefer to call it sacred science that's been verified by some fairly credible authorities such as NASA astronaut Edgar Mitchell and L. George Lawrence, the inventor of the first laser engine, have you know looked at this material and found it um, respectable. The, which is that there, the original Ark, which is referred to as the Ark of On or the Ark of Grace, um, essentially helped bring an energy on the planet that renewed the original divine blueprint of of humanity of our not just our dna but our essential divine potential and we were screwing it up we were going off in the direction of free will and you know self-gratification and that the ark was intended to help restore that signal throughout the planet and thus in our hearts and the nature of the power of the original ark was such that only women could work with it the, theory, the understanding being women have three chambers in the heart corresponded to the energy in the Ark of An, and they could work with it, but a man's having only one uh, such energetic chamber in the heart, it would simply stop the electromagnetic rhythm and he would die if he touched it. So only women priestesses could work directly with the Ark to, as a divine channel. Anyway, you come along to patriarchal um, Hebrew culture and they were not very happy with the idea that only priestesses, let alone a woman at all, could touch the Ark. And so a tamped down version um, referred to in our Templar stream as the Ark of Karma was created that men could work with. And this was the one that was in Solomon's Temple, according to this story. Now, I'm not giving this as scientifically proven or archaeologically proven or historic or anything like that, but it's a, a, a story that um, adds some perspective to to what you've shared because for me the essential question comes down to the Ark of the Covenant is this okay fantastic artifact and it's Raiders of the Lost Ark and all that but what is it why does it matter if this massacre in Ethiopia was related to you know and fantastically related to the coincidence of your discovery virtually at the same time if there is some heinous blood, you know, just cold-blooded geopolitical move to try to, as in the movie, you know, acquire a very powerful sacred object for other purposes. Well, what does that sacred object do? What is its power? What is its usefulness? What is its essential value? Apart from being like next to the Holy Grail, the most fantastic sacred object that anyone could desire. Mm -hmm. So... That's, you know, something particularly interesting to me because there does seem to be evidence that there was more than one arc, perhaps as many as five. But the one that we are centrally concerned with, of course, was the one that was in the original Solomon's Temple. And so it was such an eye-opener for me to see what you revealed and that there is this community that has been protecting the Ark for centuries, many centuries in Ethiopia. Mm. And when I saw that not only was there the massacre at the church, but that, you know, soldiers are rappelling up the cliff face to um, attack the monastery and steal the manuscripts. Well, then it begins to seem like something straight out of the movie in terms of a military geopolitical operation to acquire by brute force a 
extremely valuable object. Yeah, because as we've all seen in what I've presented in the codes that are in the New Testament part, it seems to very deliberately go into the story of Menelik, King Menelik. And we all know that part of the story as you know, whether it's myth, whether it's just legend, whether it's true, who knows, that King Solomon got together with the Queen of Sheba when she came over to uh, honor him. And they had an affair, or maybe it was a serious thing, maybe it wasn't, who knows, but the story is that she left and went back to Ethiopia and gave birth to his child. You know, that child was Menelik. So the Ethiopians regard that as just fact. That's, uh, that's their story. But what's it doing in the King James Bible? I mean, why is that? I know it's, it's not a complete cross you've got, but there's Menelik. And then there's, it, what makes it a complete cross is the word Kaporet running through it. Well, Capret is the Hebrew word for the mercy seat, the cover of the ark. But then there's another Capret in a, in, a, in a, actually this time going across to the left, in a perfectly shaped cross that looks like a sword facing this way, with the word ark and Capret. So there's two Caprets, but there's also two sets of tables. There's tables in a cross and there's another tables here. And then there's, and we know from the Bible that there's two sets of, of the so-called Ten Commandments, which is something I've never understood. What's that about? Moses breaks one set, so God says, oh, okay, let's do it again. Up the mountain we go and he writes another set. I mean, why? I understand the, the metaphor of it. Oh, the, 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 the Jews were breaking that covenant. So Moses got got mad and smashed the tables and then there was a, there was a second so there's there's two sets of everything there's two I and mean, it's all in the coast there's two sets of tables there's commandments with a with the actual word commandment broken <laughs> there's two caporets when you get to the end of it there's two there's a there's a latin word for seat throne but it's plural next to the word mercy so there's two sets of mercy seats and there's two sets of stones. One says stones with testimony through it. One says stones with Moses through it. There's an I am going this way. There's an I am going that way. And it, it all just seems to be speak <laughs> to be or not to be. There's a, is, there, is there a real arc and a, and a subterfuge arc? Is that whole story of going to eat? What's going on? In other words, it's a big mystery. But it's all tied together with this one Ethiopian word that slides in at the side, comes right in there, Tabot. And it's right there, Tabot, connecting to the Ark that's connecting to the Capra. And the Tabot is the Ethiopian word for, it, it's a stand-in for Ark, it's a stand-in for Mercy Seat, it's a stand-in for the Ten Commandments, or whatever the contents of the Ark. But it also means replica. So which is it? And all of that's very interesting, but the big question is, what's that doing in the King James Bible? Whoever did this, we know it's, I know it's John Dee and Bacon and De Vere because their fingerprints are all over it and they sign it <laughs> very convincingly. So whatever we make of it today, they thought that was a worthwhile story to be putting out in something that they're going to hide for posterity. Why? So you're mentioning that Maya's channeling or other people's channeling, other, there, are, there are other lineages that believe this and believe that. There's this constant recurring theme that there might be more than one arc. And that's definitely what the codes seem to be suggesting. So is one just a, a subterfuge? Like, oh, <laughs> go down right. that road because we're, we're protecting the real one somewhere else. Or is any of them a real arc? Or does it even matter? What's, I mean, to me, the idea of the arc has always meant the idea of focusing one's attention at the wings of the cherubim like this i got wings of cherubim here mm, mm -hmm. <laughs> right the two wings and very cherubic they are too yeah <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> um, but it's just 
I mean, that's it, isn't it? That's where God speaks to you from between the two curved wings of the cherubim on top of the, the mercy seat. To me, that's a, a clear metaphor for looking into the Kutasta Chaitanya Center and seeing the, you know, your third eye. So is that what it is? But then why would you go to the trouble of saying, oh, all this, you know, Rosicrucian cross, tree of knowledge of good and evil cross, tree of life at the top, oh, and connect it with a, a, a cross that says covenant. And then the ark, and it's all connected. They all connect to each other. And you think, okay, are they talking about a metaphor for the spiritual truth? Fine, I'm happy with that. Then why put a cross going right through the whole middle of it saying hidden in a church? Well, I love that because, you know, it goes to the question of, um, well, as you say, the only, you know, the only covenant that matters is this one, right? Yeah. And yet here's this story and this elaborate code to, to share a truth of a sacred item hidden in a church. And I remember there's, there's a, uh, a wonderful book by Aldous Huxley called The Perennial Philosophy. And he talks about the difference between the world major religions of the ones that are focused on things in time, things in a temporal sphere. And then there are those who are focused on eternal verities out of time. You know, the ones who are like about, it's called the, you know, historical religions that, you know, say, mm -hmm. okay, events in time and this prophet at this time and our people and this sacred object mm. and our city and our land mm. and our, you know, or, you know, in the Catholic Church doing the same thing in different ways. But, I must just comment. It's so that's the sonnets, mm. isn't it? I mean, the sonnets are all about these two levels of time, temporal yeah. time and eternal time, all the time he's riffing on that. Literally, events that are time-centered, oh, make sure you, you know, you, you have a child because you're young now and you, it will end. In, but then there's a whole other level about there's a, there's a dark lady, right. it's all about eternal yeah. time. But they're all about time, all of them. Yeah, yeah, in one sense or another, whether it's transcending time or how to behave while we are locked yeah. in time. And there's a great quote from Huxley on this in which he says that uh, the present moment is the only aperture through which we can pass from time into eternity, mm. present moment, the only aperture. Mm. And I, I bring that, you know, that comes to mind for me all the time because all the time, because, <laughs> you know, I mean, the here and now and how we behave in 3D matters very much. Mm. And of course, it's only, you know, about the journey to timelessness in, yeah. in, in which it matters. And, you know, Shakespeare, this is a running theme throughout the whole Shakespeare canon. In fact, you know, our friend Dr. Roger Strittmatter of Coppin State University, who did, you know, this breakthrough work, oh, about 20 years ago now, on Edward de Vere's copy of the Geneva Bible and studying the annotations and underlinings and correlating um, those underlinings to two centuries of biblical, of scholarship mm -hmm. on the Bible in Shakespeare and saying there's a clear correlation between Edward de Vere's concerns in the Bible and those of Shakespeare. And what he, in, in his preface, uh, um, Roger says that there are two major themes that run through Shakespeare in his viewpoint, which is the illusory nature of the material world, right? We mm -hmm. are such stuff as dreams are made on, our little life is rounded with a sleep, right? Or, Hamlet says I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space were it not that I have bad dreams, right? So that's one theme, the illusory nature of the material world. Mm. And then the, you know, the consequences in the lives of the characters who are so many of them seeking ambition or the crown mm. or succession or win here or position, mm. the cause and effect consequences in the life of the characters insofar as they understand the illusory nature of the material world, mm. the pointlessness of, of seeking a crown. You know, there's a wonderful thing at the end of Olivier's Richard III where, you know, oh, it's my kingdom for a horse. And then he gets, you know, he gets killed. And buried in a parking lot, as we later find out. <laughs> but you see the crown topple off his head and it rolls in the dirt. This mm -hmm. thing that everybody's been striving for. And, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. we are such stuff as dreams are made of. And so when I think about the Ark, and yeah, here's the sacred object. 
And and now we see this horrible event where 800 people were massacred protecting this sacred object. At least I should clarify, because I don't want to ever mis misrepresent. All I can say at this point about that is that that's the news that is leaking out through certain channels, but we still don't have completely open channels. There's been a, there was a media blackout, so I've seen some that say, for instance, like Al Jazeera and BBC and, um, uh, well, others I won't name, but, but that say, yes, that happened, and there are others that's, that contradict that and say, well, no, uh, there, there weren't 800 massacred outside the church. There were a lot of people mown down throughout the town. I mean, in other words, we're getting now, we're beginning to get more input from these people who walked 120 miles to escape what was going on. Certainly, it was utterly unspeakable what was going on, and there are reports that literally over all the country, thousands of people have been killed. So is it centered around the Ark, or is it just a political... A uh, cool thing that's still going on between the Eritreans and the Ethiopians and the Tigray Liberation, People's Liberation Front. You know, I mean, that certainly brings to mind scenes right out of Raiders of the Lost Ark in terms of the Nazis, you know, mowing people down in their attempt mm. to acquire the Ark. Yeah. And so you have, you know, a regime or the generals behind a, an army or... The puppeteer is above the generals because they're usually puppeteers above the generals, mm -hmm. you know, directing this horrible, bloody action at the site of, you know, this yeah, potentially I, the most sacred yeah. relic there is to be found. Yeah. And it's just the irony, you know, of an obsession with things in time, powerful things in time, mm. when, you know, from the point of view of what I, the express perspective I shared, that thing. Its only original purpose was to renew in us our awareness of the divine, our divine nature, which mm -hmm. transcends time, mm -hmm. which, you know, the ultimate achievement, which is peace and bliss, and has nothing to do with having, you know, a powerful sacred object that will help you defeat your enemies mm -hmm. and acquire some more land, gold, yeah, and of course. temporary pleasure. And yet, so the, the central question to me is, and was at the very beginning of this until I saw that hidden in a church was, is this just a metaphor? Because I understand it as a very a perfect metaphor for literally the ark is our in, in us, the truth, the, the heart, the sacred is in us or the contents of the ark. Maybe we are, we can view it in all kinds of different ways, but is there a physical object as well? Is there an as above, so below? Why Why not? Why would there not be an actual physical object that in itself, let's say, was part of a ritual that helped those practicing whatever their religious thoughts were about it at the time, help them focus? You know, in other words, we know yogis know to just go within and are blessed with having certain techniques that are as, as we know, effective. It's not the only way to get there. One can get there through intense prayer or however one wants to get there. One can do it internally. But is there a reason also for there being a physical object? And is there therefore a real one and a false one? Or, because I find that when I go deep into this with other people who have really done esoteric work on it, I won't... Uh, bring their names into, into this at the point, because it's, it's not what I'm trying to, to, to say in any way, but a lot of people will say, oh, no, the ark's not real. It doesn't matter. It's just, a, it's just it, it really refers to what's in us. It's a metaphor. Don't look for it. It's not a physical object. And um, that doesn't ring true to me. Well, there's so much more historical record about the grail as an actual existing mm. object, whereas, mm. pardon me, the, the ark, about mm. an actual existing object, whereas the grail, you know, I think can be viewed as much more, from the beginning, a metaphor, and perhaps never an actual cup from the Last Supper. That, I think, is, is much more in a gray area. But the Ark... And so, are we supposed to look for it? Of course we're supposed to look for it. That's the whole game of life, isn't it? If you can just sit back on your haunches and say, oh, I don't need to look for anything. It was nice, good stuff. You wrote a few right. clever things, but... Well, I, I, mean, I love this as a topic because I've watched your journey. <laughs> for 17 years of looking 
you know, for mm-hmm. something very mm-hmm. specific. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you like, look at the work that Emma Young, Carl Jung's wife, did on the Grail, that was her major mm-hmm. focus mm-hmm. On, on the Holy Grail, myths and legends. And, you know, which then ties into Christian Rosenkreutz and it ties into the, the, the whole arc of, pardon me, the progress of alchemy and the purpose of alchemy. And was it real? Did Could they, you know, create alchemical gold or is it just a metaphor for the purification of the soul? Exactly. And mm-hmm. that's, you know, and the, the grail as the, you know, symbol par excellence of the achievement of that purity, mm-hmm. right? And so, and here's Alan Green doing this marvelous work of discovery that starts out to be about the code, the truth about Shakespeare. Oh my goodness, it's possibly the manuscript. Oh, it's Holy Trinity. It's 624. It's 426. It's Royal Arch Freemasonry. It's a rhyming couplet in iambic tetrameter that reveals, you know, uh, the location. It's the caper with the posters in front of the altar and Alan's playing for a good long time right there it is yeah there it is <laughs> uh, because you know all of this in this search in the very avid dedicated search for a very specific physical object of great importance which is you know the manuscripts the sonnets possibly even his remains the truth about this this great soul about Shakespeare mm-hmm. and I remember you know watching this whole journey and watching you know all the 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 lessons and growth and trials that you went through and just marveling at the purification process that it was for you as I slowly went <laughs> mad well yes and you've been mad for how long now it's uh, <laughs> so how long you... have you been mad professor <laughs> Green? Glad you ask. yes um <laughs> Well, no, yeah, I mean, some would certainly view it as a as a mad folly. Uh, I have lots of trolls who keep reminding me of that all the time. How does mm. it feel to have wasted all these years of your life? Feels great. Yeah. Feels great. People say that. Thank you. Oh, not as politely as that. Well, I, yes, I have trolls. Yes, funny you should ask that. I do have people who say it in a, in a lot less polite way. What's it feel like to have wasted 17 years of your whole bloody life? Not as polite as that even. And um, it, it, it doesn't matter. It's, 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 it's wonderful. It's a great joy. It's a privilege. However, um, one of the questions that comes up is why now? I personally feel an acceleration. I, if, if, if I go back and think of that, I mean, think, we're in this room right now. Do you remember being here with me? And your 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 wife Christine in this room back then mm-hmm. fifteen years ago probably I'd been on the journey two years I was always asking you what does this mean what's this what's that play right, about what's that right, about yeah, and we were yeah. in this room and that didn't look anything like this of course and literally it's fun it's a funny idea to think oh my goodness and back then I I don't know I discovered two or three little things and hey we got it. TH is in the gravestone and the monument. Right. Wow, I am that I am. It, we've solved the whole thing. And, uh, and, and I told you to getting, stop discovering things. You, I did, that you, you need said, to stop discovering things. But right yes, that was 15 years ago. Yeah. I have to say, uh, that was a bit premature. You it could was. Have, you could have waited yeah. a little longer before. You know, the, the universal was. constants, speed of light, all that, you know. No, you don't want to go there. <laughs> so anyway, all of that, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's, the, it's the game that doesn't stop giving. It just keeps going. Oh, blah, 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 right, blah, blah, blah. Right, now we're yeah. talking about the Ark of the Covenant. So, but so the main, why now? But yeah. the question is why now? Is there some sort of acceleration? Are you feeling that in your own uh, life and studies and research? Because I know a lot of people who are. A lot of people are saying, my goodness, everything seems to be speeding up. There's something happening. Yeah. And it's that time thing again, you know. It is yeah, time. It's, it's time itself <laughs> speeding up. Because there are people who who say that they're experienced. I don't even know how that would feel to feel time speeding up. But I know how it feels. But in terms of <laughs> no, right, is true. it uh, the Doctor Who, Doctor Who episode? Doctor Who. We talk, Doctor. Yes, that one. What he talks about. <laughs> Which you know, when there's a time loop, you see, the danger is that when there's a time loop, you could end up being caught 
in a hysteresis. You could end up being caught in a hysteresis. In a hysteresis. You could end up being caught in a hysteresis. In a hysteresis. And it's a time loop, right? You know, I mean, it, 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 that's the episode. Tom Baker is the Tom Baker version a long time ago. So I almost got caught in one myself just now. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, I live in a place in the San Luis Valley in Colorado where this sort of thing happens. I mean, there are electromagnetic anomalies because it's the largest freshwater aquifer on the North American continent. It goes down 30,000 feet, and there's a layer of crystals and gold beneath that, and it's just wacky. There's portals and UFOs and people disappearing and people walking into mountains to caves that weren't there the day before. And actually, the legend is that this is where the original of the Ark is is inside Mount Challenger in Custer, wait, Colorado. Wait, wait, Fourth dimensional, we're not going wait, there. It's wait. a different story. It's a different story. No, it's... you can't just drop that on us and then say, oh, that's actually where the original arc is. <laughs> like, you know where it is? Um, what are we just say wasting our believe... time for? Okay. Hello? Okay. Hello? No, Can I, I have some just help say here? that <laughs> I have it on the very best authority. No. That, You've um, got the arc. No, I know. I, I live about maybe two miles from where it is reported to be. But it's on the fourth dimension. You can only get in there if you oh. have to be in the right vibration on the right day and you walk into this place. It's it's the oh, mists of Avalon. Person. It's either you pass through the mists of Avalon or you end up with the nuns in their robes at Glastonbury and you're very disappointed because you're not with the priestesses on Avalon. It's very disappointing. So it's that kind of thing. You, but, you describe this as though from personal experience. I I could do like the nudge, nudge, hint, hint, wink, <laughs> wink, and pretend that it had happened to me, but it hasn't. Oh. No, um, but but there are phenomenal. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, phenomenal, phenomenal things okay. that, that happen there, and it, it's a story worthy of respect and investigation. Mm. Um, that the original of the ark was, as I shared, you know, such a powerful sacred device that it actually vibrated, sort of phased between third and fourth dimensions, and is now primarily on the fourth dimension, not visible, not touchable, is being worked with by high beings in a fourth dimensional location. That's about as far as I'm willing to go. I'm not saying I know this or, or am intellectually convinced of it based mm. on empirical evidence. I'm just saying that I've seen and experienced enough to make me think it's quite possible. Let's just put that. I That's all I wanted you on this show to bring forward to us because I want to start a conversation about it. All of you out there, you probably have your own ideas of what it means. Get a hold of us. Talk to us about it. We we are not sitting here saying, you know, I don't, I don't okay. know. All I'm saying is, look at this stuff and why is it there in the King James Bible? So, yeah, and I, you know, just to answer the why now thing a little more specifically. I mean, a lot of people these days, of course, talking about this ascension concept uh, the phenomenon or expected phenomenon of ascension which is understood to be a sort of mass upgrade of the human consciousness created by you know we're moving through this plasma cloud and it's from the central sun of the galaxy and it happens every twenty four thousand years and our dna is being woken up and again couldn't square to it i'm not intellectually convinced of it but there's a narrative going on that's worthy of investigation and that the long arc of this is in fact and that word keeps coming up was the ultimate goal of the templars the ultimate goal of the templars was to assist in support and help facilitate the spiritual evolution of humanity specifically with this moment in mind this moment that we are in now in mind when many people believe that this massive spiritual upgrade is underway and that for the revelations of the codes, your discoveries, Graham Hancock's work, the horrible events at the church in Ethiopia to all be happening at this time of apparent acceleration mm. of events and growth towards hopefully some breakthrough and the idea, of course, is that there will be a literal separation of, of worlds, of timelines, and that those who move into the upgraded vibration will simply naturally find themselves, metaphorically speaking, in Avalon. And those who move into a vibration of fear and, and of an obsession with things in time, as we're talking about, will actually find themselves along a different timeline. 
Now, I just got to, as a common sense guy, I instinctively resist this. I like, you know, sequences and linear, you know, dominoes and this leads. But again, I've, I've had to face the reality that I have seen too much of a coherent story in this and of a long arc mm. of evolution and spirit and story towards such a moment. And it certainly makes sense to me of the question of why now, in terms of this discovery coming out, your work. If this were the only major revelation of your work, that would be worthy. Of course, it comes on dozens of other revelations that, that you brought forward, which, you know, so many of which have, have huge impact, potentially. So I love it. I mean, just as a storyteller, I love this. I mean, I obviously... Mm. You know, there's there's tragedy in any great story, and and uh, you know, I, I feel as if I've misspoken in saying I could love a story that had such terrible things as part of it. But I'm reminded of Game of Thrones, season eight. Everybody hated it. Episode six, final episode. What a terrible wrap up! But there was this wonderful moment where Tyrion Lannister he's in chains, and the lords and ladies say, "Oh yeah, well, who do you think should be king, a dwarf?" And he asks. I've had a lot of time to think in my prison cell about our bloody history, our tragedies, our wars, our mistakes. What unites people? Is it gold? Is it armies? Is it flags? No. Stories. There's nothing more powerful than a good story. Nothing can stop it. No army can defeat it. And who has a better story? And then he turns to the crippled boy and says, then Bran the Broken, who became this great mystic, the three-eyed raven, he is the one who can lead us into the future, right? And so, you know, when I look at this story and and of, of the mystery of Shakespeare and of your journey, you know, your story alone, Alan, is an amazing, powerful um revelation and so as i see this you know terrible aspect of this story unfolding it has such gravity and depth that i feel it needs to be brought to the world the, the full story of how your journey and your search led to this moment and that's why now and of course, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamed of in your philosophy. And that always shocks me. Mm. As though he's saying, you don't know half of it, <laughs> what's yeah. really going on. Yeah. Even in the terror, even in the, I mean, because we don't know. Yeah. We don't know what death is saying, right? I don't know. A, a, a really deep and in, in some ways terrifying uh, vision when I learned of, of this news and I was thinking about it such a lot and I was lifted out of my uh, sadness and my shock about it. We can always cut this out if it's all wrong, but I feel I should say it. So let me just, I've always felt that death is the most beautiful thing and we have no idea, right? You, you mm. die and you have no idea how utterly, unexpectedly, blissfully beautiful it is. And we get these reports from people with near-death experiences who say, oh, I didn't want to come back. This was the, most, oh, this was the greatest day of my life. Mm. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. the day I died, right? And I know that's the truth. And I think we, anyone who's tasted even a little, tiny, tiny, tiny bit, bit of bliss, for whatever little bliss we have felt in our own personal practice, you know that that's what you want forever and, and mm. all the rest of it doesn't matter once you taste it, right? Right. And you know that with death comes, it's got to be like, <gasps> oh, <laughs> thank you. Terrible for the, pe the people who are left, mm -hmm. who don't see anything but agony.
it's a hard thing to talk about. Certainly, uh, it, 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 it's a difficult thing to even try to 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 convey and say. Look, Yogananda w w was confronted with once a mother who had lost her son, and he wrote a letter to her in which he said, "Don't even read this now." He told her not to read it now. I think I'm getting this right. I'm paraphrasing somewhat, but it, essentially the story was told her not not to read it now. Read it years later. You will only understand it years later. And when she did finally read it, he w he was saying that because you know you will never understand, and it's the pointless of me to to say anything. It will just sound trite. You just lost your son. Yeah. <laughs> Except you don't know what he's experiencing and how beautiful it is. Mm. But you can't say that to a mother in pain or no. to yeah. those who survive a, a massacre. But I had this this intense vision of of uh, of the, that experience for those. Because mm. if they were there protecting the ark, they died in the most selfless act they could possibly give. And they yeah. immediately, instead of feeling a hail of bullets, felt angels blessing them. Mm. Admittedly, a difficult thing to say, a difficult thing to understand, but I felt it. I felt like <gasps> it was just ecstasy. And we don't know that. We can't grasp that. I can't say it's the truth, right? But I mean, that's what I feel is going on. But we'll probably cut this because that's an awful thing to say. <laughs> but I, f I felt that. I felt okay. like that they were just, <gasps> wow. Yeah. We were just released from all our pain and all our, this miserable life we've been living here and we passed the test we went to protect it mm. and we were just sent into the most blissful heaven yeah could be truth well i'll tell you what i i can tell a funny story about death okay we need to... <laughs> bring it back with fun <laughs> and funny story funny story about death i don't know um we may cut this too we'll find out but it's just about different attitudes towards death within American culture. Yeah. For example, right? So um, I have a friend, uh, also known to you, Dee Dee, uh, mm -hmm. who lives in LA. And she was originally Dee Dee of the pop duo Dick and Dee Dee in the early 60s. Dee -dee. And they had some hits Dee -dee. and they were on Dick Clark and Shindig and uh, Mountains High and, and things like that. And um, I ended up doing revivals, doo revivals, because Dick had passed away. Mm. Dick St. John mm. of yeah. Dick and Dee Dee a, a fell off a roof uh, trying to rake some leaves and broke his neck. And then fans said, hey, Dee Dee, why aren't you out on the circuit? And, well, you know, Dick passed away. So, But we got together, and so I went out because uh, I had a very similar voice, and, and we sounded good. So so we're doing a, sh we're doing a show. And we would do three or four songs, and there'd be like eight doo backs on the bill, and then Dick and Dee Dee would come on, and, and Dee Dee was, you know, kind of emceeing. She's out front. And so we'd sing our opening song, and then she'd say, I want to dedicate this next song to Dick St. John, who composed it, right? Now, this reveals, of course, that I'm not Dick St. John, and that therefore this is only half of the real Dick and Dee Dee. But the promoter comes up to us afterwards, and he says, don't do that again. Don't do that memory of Dick St. John thing. I don't want any death on my show. No death on my show. <laughs> okay? We're not going to talk about death from the stage of my show. You got that? I said, oh. Okay, no death. All right? <laughs> Too bad. Okay, so then people started telling me, because they thought I was the real dick, just how good I looked after 40 years. <laughs> Said, because I saw you in Houston in 1966, and you look so good. Said, well... What can I tell you? So uh, anyway, so then we get most of we played the West Coast, nice venues, but then we get booked into the Carl Perkins Auditorium in Jackson, Tennessee. Oh wow! And I was like, oh, this is cool. And we got a country music promoter out in Nashville, and first thing he does, we get there and he says, "Don't worry about rehearsal. We got an all-you-can-eat chicken dinner. You're gonna sit down with the band. You gotta meet everybody." So this is very folksy, very sweet, and it comes to the gig. And he's also the MC, the promoter, and he's introducing us. He said, I've got some great songs from a couple that you call Dick and Dee Dee, but this isn't the real Dick. <laughs> this Michael Dunn sings so good because the real Dick died. 
<laughs> he fell off the roof and broke his neck. Everybody <laughs> goes, oh, man, this is country music. Songs about death are fine. <laughs> great, my baby's dead. <laughs> but anyway, so, I mean, to have, you know, to move into that, and it, it was like, oh, great. So the audience came out and loved me because I wasn't dead. You know? <laughs> But anyway, you know, it's like just a different understanding of death. You know, in the South, they're more grounded. And heck, you know, they got invaded in the Civil War and the North didn't. So mm -hmm. it's just, you know, it's it's part of life. And we think of it as this great tragedy, the ultimate thing to be avoided. And it's actually the ultimate thing to be welcomed if we are living fully. Well, not yeah. one of us can avoid it. So we might as well get we keep peaceful trying. with the idea of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, Michael, uh, really, thank you so much for coming and uh -huh. sharing your insights into into this. I, I, I'm just, it's a delight always. We usually get together and we just hang Giggle. out and joke <laughs> and... Yeah. rip each other apart into in playful fashion sure yeah. uh, and and it's great but to be able to uh share it and 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 say something meaningful hopefully about what it is uh, that this whole thing is about that shakespeare yeah. wants us to know for some reason and the people around that whole shakespeare Thing, whatever that was which I more and more and more realize is this oh my goodness it was a Shakespeare thing it wasn't the Shakespeare person yeah. it was a Shakespeare event in, that they all decided to come and incarnate and give the world this incredible gift of first of all the writings anyway that stand on their own as the greatest in literature and and yet at the same time hey, who knew He's, they're playing a game with us and it's a puzzle and it's a treasure hunt and it's really about you find out who you really are that's yeah. always about you <laughs> no yeah, it's just it's the yeah. most wonderful yeah. thing yeah when you realize oh it's not this for any of those of you out there who want to turn your friends onto this and you're scared to because you think your friends will say oh shakespeare no i don't really want to oh that's a bit stuffy isn't it no you know it's not stuffy and it's it's the most surprising shakespeare you've ever heard, learned about right yeah because it's not at all it's this massive incredible mystery magical tour no i did exactly. not exactly i did not break any copyright there by putting magical yeah. first and but it is isn't it and yeah. we know we, we know that and you turn me on to it thank you my my great pleasure and privilege yeah. and uh, <laughs> thank all of you for supporting this amazing fellow and his amazing work so my friend thank you i'll see you next time i hope time 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 When's that? When is there a next time? Next. I'm, I'm sorry to cut you again, but can we try that? Uh, um, What's he doing? We, we were still. We try what? Yeah, yeah. It, it was just like I missed you when you, when you spoke to a camera. Like uh, I, I switched camera, you spoke to one, but then. Uh, oh, okay. It was off. Sorry. Okay, was great. Time, but, so okay, I'm going to turn and start in three, two, one. <clears throat> uh, sure, and then yeah, just. To, yeah, just do that one. thing again where you praise me. Right. Okay. To the sky. Do that. Do that part again. <laughs> Yes. Where you thank me for everything that I've done I, uh, for, for, yes, for the world. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, a yeah, lifetime right. achievement award, and just just do that part yeah. again. Okay, but much so, longer and more more flattering. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here go we deeper go. into so it. You can take it, Alan, to say um, to, uh, so thank you, um, Michael Dunn. Yeah. So everybody, <laughs> have, have it. Yeah. It's, uh, to camera one, okay. to say goodbye to the audience, and then to Michael. Kind of like just camera one, middle one. All right. I'm going to say it to there. Yes, please. Right, well, thank you, Michael. It's been great. Loved it. Come again sometime. Fucking terrific. Thanks a lot. It's always a thrill. Uh, I'm going to bed. Thanks. I'm tired. I'll do that again. It wasn't quite right. <laughs> Ha ha ha!
That was Sir Michael Caine, I believe, wasn't it? Pretty oh, close. I could do a good Michael Caine. I could do a good Michael Caine. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. You're welcome, <clears throat> Michael. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> no idea what I'm going to say now. What's his name again? <laughs> no! We'll just roll into it. <laughs> Well, thank you, Michael. It really has been a, a real thrill, a real pleasure. I'm so glad you could come along and share all your wisdom with us about this this incredible information that's surfacing now in this particular time. We don't know why, but we're having a blast finding out, and I hope you are too. Thank my friend, Michael Dunn. Hmm. Well... You are so very welcome. It's an amazing uh, privilege, and you know this is this is like um, heaven to me to to be here and and talk about things that I can talk about with no other human on the planet. So, let's do it again. None of that works. <laughs> <laughs>